Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Catherine Peterson, and I am a project manager at HCH Enterprises. For those of you who do not know HCH, we are a public sector consulting firm based in Warwick, Rhode Island. We work on a broad range of public projects, including grant writing, grant administration, and broadband deployment. Today's webinar is one in a series that we run to keep our customers up to speed on new events happening in the public sector. So there's a lot going on in the public grant space. In fact, one of our VPs who has been involved in public grants for more than 30 years calls this the golden age of federal grants. After more of than three decades of declining federal grants, the post-pandemic era is marked by the steepest increase in federal grants particularly discretionary or competitive grants in U.S. history. HCH works with grant writers from around the country, and we work with our clients to find the best grant writers for the project or issue that they are dealing with. We have people in the house who write grants, but we also maintain strong partnerships with teams that have expertise in particular areas. Today, I'm so pleased to be able to introduce one of our favorite broadband grant writing partners, I'll let them introduce themselves, but I will just say that the Learn, Design, and Apply LDA team has been successful in developing broadband project grant proposals that really resonate with reviewers. And we are delighted to have them here today to share their insights on how to write powerful proposals. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to our panelists as we explore how to write grants that will support universal broadband accessibility. And to kickstart this presentation, I have the pleasure of introducing. Um, our first panelist, Megan Bursford, who is the Director of Broadband at LDA. Not only is Megan a fantastic writer with a BA in English, Megan is fantastic at driving initiatives to bridge digital divides, which also drives empowering community. Next up, we have Sarah Rizak, who is a broadband specialist at LDA. Sarah holds a BS in Environmental Studies and an MA in Sustainable Community. Her passion for research and community engagement has led her to excel in grant writing. And my name is Catherine Peterson, and I am a project management support analyst at HCH. And I have a BA in business communications, and a pro I'm a professional writer and reporter in grant writing and local government analytics. I would also like to introduce someone who is not on our official panelist, but HCH's VP of public sector, who will be here to answer some of the questions at the end. All right, if we can get started with the first slide. All right, Megan is here to share the importance of grant and community development, and this is titled Grant Funding for Community Development Projects. Thank you, Catherine, um, and thank you uh, again for having both myself and Sarah on this webinar. We're really happy to join and share our knowledge and expertise in this area. Um, as noted, uh, we have a special broadband team here at our company that just focuses on broadband grants. Um, and so we bring uh, a wealth of knowledge in that. We've been very successful in what we do, both in state and federal grants. So we're gonna tell you here about some of our thoughts, some of our learnings, some of our tips. Uh, to hopefully inspire you and help anyone on this call uh, in thinking about how to uh, approach a broadband project. Uh, so broadband is, is essential. I think we can all recognize that. We're here on this webinar together. Um, but when you think about community development, uh, broadband is, you know, in a way that the foundation of this, when we think about digital equity projects, when we think about, um, you know, different telehealth, when we think about uh, distance learning, when we think about all of these areas, environmental impact, if you're somewhere rural and you're thinking about um, agriculture, smart agriculture, all of it comes back to broadband. Um, so when you're thinking about community development, you should also be thinking about broadband uh, because it is that fundamental foundation uh, for a lot of the strategies going on. So that might lead me into the next slide, if we can move forward. Thinking creatively. So um, obviously there is a lot of broadband specific funding out there right now, uh, but it's not the only way to get this funding. So when you're doing a broadband project, it often requires multiple sources of funding. 
Um, so while you know looking at uh, the USDA program or NTIA program, uh, you can also think about you know housing and urban development. So we had a client who was able to get a HUD grant um, for smart communities and build out their broadband infrastructure that way. So within a lot of these different grant programs that you see out there that may have not quite a direct focus on broadband, you'll often see in there that broadband is an eligible expense. Um, so you shouldn't pass up these opportunities. You know, you don't want to be laser focused on uh, NTIA for your only source. And the reason this is good is because it comes back to that community development. Um, so communicating amongst your community, finding out who else is doing a project in the area, um, knowing you know, what kind of economic development projects are happening and seeing how what you're looking to do uh, can align with, with those projects. Um, again, looking at broadband as a, a key component of uh, you know, all of this development, there's usually an opportunity in there. So talking to your community organizations, especially talking to local government, they have usually a pretty good awareness of, of what folks are doing in the community, either if they're an applicant themselves or you know, they're already providing letters of support for other projects. Learning how you can be involved there uh, is another way to, to get that funding that you need to do broadband projects. Um, again, looking at uh, you know, when we're talking about elected officials, uh, we're getting into a big era of earmarks right now. Um, so this is appropriations that senators are given to, you know, spend in specific areas. Um, and so it is always helpful to, you know, if you have the opportunity, talk to a senator uh, in your area and see what they're interested in, uh, see what they're thinking of doing with that money to be spent. Um, because again, it, it may, in one way or another, align with a broadband project. So um, once you have this initial idea of knowing exactly where you want to build broadband, you start reaching out and seeing who else might be in that area. Um, again, getting that full robust community development, community engagement, uh, and also the creative way of getting your funding. Next slide. Yeah, actually, Megan, I have a oh, yeah. question for you if you don't mind answering. Absolutely. Um, but um, how can community stakeholders effectively advocate for improved broadband access to policymakers? So I would say, and our first kind of answer for this is always to reach out to your state broadband office. Um, so right now, all of the states are actively, you know, engaged in some at different stages in, in the game, but um, with the community and finding out the state of broadband in their state. Um, so if they're doing their job right, which many of them are, they're becoming aware of where that lack is. Um, and if they're not aware, it's a great place to make it known, right? Because then they have to assess how are they gonna spend all of this big money that's coming towards them. So when you wanna make sure that your community is the one that is receiving funds to become you know, connected uh, and to get that, that you know, broadband service that is needed, they're the first source to know and should be the first source to know, uh, you know what might be happening in that area. So our first suggestion is to always look to, to your state broadband office. Um, and again, if they don't know, it's a good thing to make them aware of. You know, they wanna know. Um, so that's kind of our, our first step there. And um, as part of that, they're usually then engaged with those in communities who are doing digital equity work or broadband work. Um, so not only are they learning about what areas are unserved, they're learning about who is actively doing things in this area already. Um, so they can then get you in touch with those people in a more uh, local manner. Megan, that's a great point. Um, the last question I have for you about that is, is this all public info? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, I guess <laughs> I guess it depends upon uh, what part of it. Um, so uh, a lot of the uh, folks who are doing work in this area for uh, building broadband networks for the digital equity are pretty vocal, are pretty active. Um, if you you can go and see if there's been funding given in that area, um, the FCC has a great map that has combined different agency funding that you can go look at. Uh, and then your offices, your state broadband offices, should be collecting that knowledge as well. Um, and it, you know, since it is is the you know with a state, it's open for for information. And if you don't see it somewhere, you can always do a FOIA. 
Um, but most of that is, is, you know, something you can find. What you probably can't find, and this might be getting into some of the nitty gritty, a lot of telecom people won't tell you where their um, fiber is buried. Um, so they do that for their own kind of competitive reasons. They don't want to share that information. They don't even share it with the broadband offices. So if you're looking in kind of build a network and you want to know where something's in the ground, that might not be publicly available information. Um, but you can find out who has a presence in your area through a variety of sources that are public. Great. Thank you so much, Megan, for answering that. All right, I think that brings us actually on to our next slide. Perfect. Um, so, you know, as, as we kind of did an introduction here, we have worked on quite a few of these projects. We have a team and this is all we do. So we do have quite a few lessons learned um, from, from, you know, our years of putting together these applications. Um, and what we'll include here is also trends that we're seeing going forward. Um, so things, you know, as we know, change over time and what states are looking for and what NTIA or other federal agencies are looking for to see in applications. Um, one of the things that we have seen really grow uh, is that requirement for community engagement. So kind of what we've been talking about thus far. Um, the state of New Mexico had a program where I believe it was a fourth to a third of the points were given based on community engagement. Um, so this is such a strong thing and, and we have seen applications fail because they didn't have you know, strong enough community engagement. And community engagement isn't just getting letters of support, right? It's, are you going to your town halls? Uh, are you going to the farmer's markets and telling people? Are you getting you know, buy-in from, from different um, you know, public entities? If it's the school district, if it's the fire department, um, you know, you really want to show that you have a robust project put together. Um, so we're seeing a lot more emphasis on, on this community engagement. Um, in addition to that, they really like to see public-private partnerships. Um, historically, this hasn't always been the case, but we are seeing that as a trend now that, um, you know, a, a lot of granting agencies are seeing the strength in these kinds of things. And in addition, it can give you not only, you know, the support, but you're getting an additional source of expertise, which looks good when you're talking about your knowledge base and your ability to deploy a project. Um, but you could also be getting different sources of match funding. Um, so a lot of grants are going to be requiring, you know, up to maybe a 20% match, 25% match, sometimes 50% match, depending upon where you're falling in your project. And so having a public-private partnership can give you more sources of match funding. Um, so, you know, you're putting less upfront from each different, different partner. Um, so, you know, that's a, another thing that you want to start cultivating within the community um, to make sure that, that you have those strong relationships ready to go. Um, another good thing, you know, and, and we've seen this as well as someone might have a really great idea they've recognized a need they say let's go for it but then it gets down to doing the grant and you're not actually sure of many elements of it so when we're talking about broadband you know we're talking about um where exactly is the need right like which block in your community is served or is underserved um you know where is the the access really lacking um so doing a lot of preliminary work is required for a strong application. Um, so if you don't have some of those nitty gritty details, if you're not sure what public safety is doing um, in terms of their broadband needs, uh, you're not gonna have as strong of an application. So whether this is a, a feasibility study, whether it's a needs assessment, you wanna put together uh, materials and have that knowledge of the exact uh, needs of the community, before you start. So while you may relatively know, oh, we don't have access here, you wanna get really detailed and granular in that, or you're not gonna have that competitive application. Right, no, that's a, that's a great point. And I, I just wanted to ask another question if you have a second, but um, how do you find, I know you addressed this a little earlier, but how do you find elected officials if you are not already involved in the community? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, 
you know, and it's always a funny answer to say the internet when we're talking about grants to get people the internet, <laughs> but uh, you can you can look up your elected officials if you're, you know, uh, don't have sufficient access uh, going to, to uh, your town hall. Um, you know, they have that information of who your local affected elected official are, and also then a great resource for finding out, you know, who, who your state officials are and then who is representing your state federally. Um, so definitely uh, looking it up, you know, you can say, you know, town XYZ state representative, or if you know your district. Um, I also found, and, and this is kind of a fun little thing, is libraries are a, librarians in particular, are a great source of information like this. The number of questions I have asked the local librarian, um, you know, I think they, they actually kind of love it. So uh, going and asking your local librarian is also a great option as well. Yeah, Megan, that's a great point. I never even thought of that. Um, oh, they yeah. love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, I think now is a great time to actually launch our first poll question. And this is just about how to engage in your community. Um, so if you can just take a quick moment for each one of you that are in attendance to answer this, that would be great. We'll give it a couple seconds. All right, we'll put another five seconds in here and then see if we can close this out. Hi, Catherine. This is Chelsea Lovebeck, um, Director of Marketing for HCH. I just wanted to report on some of that poll's progress. Um, right now, we have 17% says yes regularly. 33% say occasionally, and 50% says no, rarely. Oh, that's extremely interesting. So yeah, absolutely. Um, engaging with your community is probably the best bet for you if you're going into um, grant writing and wanting to learn more about the effectiveness. So no, I really appreciate those answers. That kind of gives us a little check mark on on where we're at with our audience, but awesome. All right, well, Megan, if you can take us to the next slide, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. All right, so this kind of, I would say, ties into what we just learned on our, our poll there. So if you have a project in mind, um, it's good to know that you are not duplicating efforts um, because that is a sure way to not get funded. Um, your agency might know that, oh, someone's already doing this in your area. Um, so it's it's important to kind of talk amongst the community, um, going to the community economic development agency or uh, your, your public officials, your town hall, your city hall, um, and learning about what's happening. And thankfully, those groups are often then, if they are engaged, have an awareness of grant opportunities. Um, and so uh, they can be a great resource for learning about what is happening in your area. There's also lots of agencies, lots of websites um, that, that track grants. Um, so you can find someone who might be focused on digital equity, right? So. Um, NDIA is, is, is an association for digital equity and they track grant opportunities that relate to that. So if you follow their page, you subscribe to their newsletter, you can see what's coming out for grants and digital equity if that is your company's goal. Um, if your company's goal has to do with agriculture, you can subscribe to newsletters from USDA uh, that relate to their grants and they send updates and notices about what is happening. Um, so definitely, you know, subscribing to these things, talking to local communities uh, is a great way to know kind of one, what's happening in the space, who might be engaged in it, and what opportunities are coming up. Um, obviously, another great option, talk to LDA, talk to HCH. Uh, this, is, this is what we both do. And I know we're, we're all happy to talk about, you know, what might be happening and, and where the best funding opportunity might be. Again, thinking creatively of, of where your project could fit, where that goal can be aligned. Next yeah, slide. that's great. 
or questions. <laughs> Yeah, actually, this is a good time to remind everyone that's in the chat that if you have any questions as well, please put it in there and we can answer that for you. All right, and I think uh, uh, I'm actually turning it over to Sarah now, who's going to talk actually more about some of the nitty gritties of actually putting together the proposal. So I had kind of a, a high level getting you up to the point, and now Sarah's going to kind of take it from here. And once you have aligned your goals and found your partners and you're ready to go, uh, then it gets down to some of the work. So Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much, Megan. Um, as Megan said, the next couple of slides, I'm just going to take some time to kind of share the best practices in the pieces within grant writing that we really try to focus on. Um, to, for creating successful applications. Um, so this includes discovering the essential components of your grant proposal um, and kind of going through that clear project description goals and then having measurable outcomes. Um, and we'll also kind of provide some of our techniques um, that we've developed over the years for effectively communicating your organization's capacity and expertise. Um, and then kind of lastly, a big kind of best practice that we'll touch on a little bit in the next slides, is understanding the importance of incorporating data, research, and then compelling storytelling to engage your grant reviewers. So next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, so um, one of the big, the big pieces that we found is essential for writing a successful grant is being able to effectively tell your story and demonstrate the impact that your grant application will bring. When writing your grants, it's a, you will want to make sure that you are painting a powerful story that inspires the grant reviewers to get behind your project. Storytelling is about leveraging both logical and emotional tools that build your vision. Um, you'll want to make sure that you leverage statistics to lay the foundation for your story. Um, you can find this in many different places. We utilize census data quite a bit, um, county health data, school ratings, just anything statistical that will kind of bring those grant reviewers into the reality of what your community is facing. Um, within the storytelling, this is a great opportunity to really leverage and showcase your community engagement efforts. Um, we oftentimes rely very heavily on personal stories and we found that that the personal stories that you're able to collect through your engagement um, really can lead to a successful application and showcase that this isn't just a broad project that, that is kind of just generalized. This is something that the community has been involved in and that they've brought this need to you. Um, and so you'll wanna ask yourself, in what specific ways will, you pro will your, your project positively impact the, this community in need? Um, so ultimately, you'll want to showcase kind of the day-to-day -day struggles that your targeted, targeted community faces and ask yourself, what barriers are there? So what are the barriers that we're experiencing between getting connectivity into these areas? Um, you'll also want to showcase within your story how your community stands apart from others. Is there a unique critical need in the area um, like for example is um, education kind of a barrier is there a barrier with economics um, specifically for broadband grants you'll want to address um, kind of how will broadband equip this community with the necessary tools to achieve a greater quality of life um, and that that kind of that point on the quality of life that's really a focus area that a lot of the grants that we interact with kind of want to see um, storytelling is not just about the facts, but helping the reviewers see the better future that your project will bring. Um, and that ultimately is the goal of telling that story. Um, when writing this story, make sure to utilize kind of what you found in the notice of funding opportunity. Um, a, great, a great question to ask kind of when you're going through the NOFO um, is, do they do they prioritize a certain area like economics or education? You'll really want to highlight these specific needs to to really call out that you understand what the funding opportunity is seeking to address within the communities. Um, beyond the story of the community, it's also really important to paint the story of your organization. 
what drives your passion and sets you apart from the others seeking to serve the same community. Um, you'll want to really include your mission, your vision, any efforts that you've done over the years to really make sure that this project has a foundation in the community and is viable for the years to come. Um, as I, as we've talked about before, community engagement is such an integral piece to a lot of these grant applications. Um, so just make sure to highlight that um, just from your organization, how you've been involved, but then also utilize that in those stories that you come across to build this picture for the grant reviewers. Um, within, grant, within the storytelling, it's also important to ensure that you have the measures in place to monitor the impact that your project will bring within the community. This will help you track progress over time and also show the reviewers that your project is both attainable and realistic and will set forth the, the desired outcomes. So yeah, um, Catherine, do you have any questions on that? I do actually. So I think you made some really great points about um, the storytelling um, aspect of it and the importance of it. I can completely agree with you that it, it creates more of a connection um, something that I wanted to ask was, would you mind sharing additional instances where grant funded initiatives have significantly improved community well being and quality of life? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we see it um, all the time just in um, kind of those regular partners that and the clients that we work with that have come back to us over and over again. Um, they've seen significant economic improvement, um, the development of remote job opportunities, remote education. Um, broadband really has supported these communities in instrumental ways. Um, we've worked quite intensively with a lot of clients in Washington State, um, and it's it's been, honestly, as a grant writer, it's the most inspirational thing to to hear about those stories of like, hey, this is the impact that we've had and we want to continue this network and build it out so that we can continue bringing these efforts and these benefits um, within communities that are unserved. So um, yeah, we've definitely seen a lot of great support um, within these communities just from the efforts of bringing broadband. Right, that's fantastic. I'm so glad that we're able to kind of cover some examples of instances where this helps them really engaging in your community is so important and can and it can really you know draw some fantastic aspects to where you see next. So um, thank you for that, Sarah. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide? Yes. Perfect. So um, another, another just critical piece of grant management that we find is um, having a project management system um, in place that works well for you and the individuals that are supporting this initiative and this application. Um, ultimately, project management is about being able to to manage your time in a way that maximizes the outcome that you're producing. Um, grants can definitely be overwhelming. Um, when you first look at that notice of funding opportunity, you might be thinking to yourself, "What? where do I go from here? Um, kind of thinking through project management upfront will end up saving time and breaking down the grant application piece by piece so that it makes it a lot less overwhelming. Um, it makes it just something attainable where you can be super intentional about the pieces that you're putting together um, and ensure just the timely um, development of this grant application. Um, so we recommend um, creating a system that works for you and then also kind of maximizes that time. Um, you'll want to start by getting organized when you first have the application or this initiative or project in mind. Um, the first thing that our team kind of starts out with is going through the notice of funding opportunity and really picking out those pieces that we mentioned. Are they prioritizing community engagement? Um, is there going to be a lot of financial lift within this application? What are the grant reviewers going to be looking for and how can we kind of meet these? So from kind of doing a deep dive into the notice of funding, you'll then want to kind of assess where your project is. A lot of our applicants sometimes come with preliminary materials. They might already have a preliminary engineering design. Um, we do have people that kind of start from the ground up. That's completely fine. But you'll want to make sure that when you're developing your um, system for project management, that you really sit down and take into account where is my project right now and where do I want it to be by the time this application comes around. Um, you'll also want to develop a timeline um, that kind of breaks 
this grant down this application down piece by piece um, as i mentioned before this really is useful for um breaking it down and just viewing it um section by section so you can intentionally mark off what the reviewers are asking versus looking at it all at once and getting overwhelmed and kind of overthinking it i think it's very i think megan can agree it's very easy to look at a grant application and immediately overthink it if you're not intentional about breaking it down um we also utilize our kickoff calls very very intentionally this is a great time to divide up the responsibilities of the team that's going to be working on this grant application and also establish the expectations for communication in the different roles um, check to see okay are we going to meet regularly are we doing weekly meetings um, is there anyone that's going to be out of office a particular week uh, make sure that your timeline really aligns with those expectations and the roles of the individuals working on this project um, you'll also want to kind of discuss within your kickoff call the ways that your project will be set apart from other applicants. Um, this is kind of a great time to utilize that storytelling and start painting that vision so that as you're bringing grant elements together and checking them off that um, you're really meeting everything that you want to share. Um, and kind of the last piece that I want to the last recommendation I want to provide, don't overlook the waiting periods. Um, oftentimes you'll hear that, okay, there's a notice of funding coming out on this date. And then you find that, okay, a couple months later, the notice of funding still hasn't come out. How can you utilize that gap within that gap in time within when you have the notice of funding? Um, just make sure that you can maximize that. This would be a great opportunity for, um, kind of gathering your organizational documents, um, looking at your co your company history, um, pulling together resumes. This could be a great time for pre preliminary design, but make use of every single second if you're going after a grant, whether it's open or it's not. Um, don't overlook that waiting period. So yeah, that's kind of the main pieces for project management. Catherine, if you have any. Yeah, thank you. I yeah, I actually have something to add. Um, in project management myself, I just wanted to reiterate the fact that at its core, um, you know, the project management framework really serves as the blueprint for a lot of the life cycle of the grant funded project. Um, you know, this project, I mean, it, the framework plays a crucial role in kind of transforming the written proposal into the actual tangible results, which is really cool. But it kind of goes beyond um, just the words, but it's about you know, laying out that strategic roadmap that outlines not only like the overreaching goals, but kind of the nitty gritty details that brings those goals to fruition. It's really awesome. But yeah, like you said, again, that clear goal setting, which is, um, you know, that crystal clear articulation of the project's goals and outcomes and objectives. Um, and then that structured um, timeline. And those are the backbone of the effective project management and like a well-defined timeline really breaks down that project into manageable phases, you know, each with its own set of tasks, deadlines, and milestones. Um, it really prevents confusion and, you know, ensures steady progress. So I'm really glad that you stated the importance of that because I can completely agree. Um, I think that we should probably move on to a poll question um, and that would be about navigating through applications. Um, so I'm gonna give everybody kind of the chance to go through this and put this in the chat. Um, it'd be about 15 seconds so we can kind of get a checkpoint of this. All right, we'll give it a couple more seconds and then we'll be ready to see the results. Hi, Catherine, this is Chelsea again. When it comes to grant applications, how familiar are you with the process of navigating through the application requirements? Our audience said 100% somewhat familiar. Oh, that's great. Those are some, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm glad that uh, we have some ways of looking into it. Um, so people are a little bit familiar. Um, so that's good. 
I will jump in. I realize I sent, I meant to send a message to everyone. I just sent it to my fellow panelists, but was going to reiterate one of the, one of the um, benefits of really breaking down the opportunity is being able to identify where responsibilities go. Um, because I think we can all agree, you know, you never want unnecessary people on a call that don't need to be there. It can really, you know, bog up your timeline of what you're trying to do when you have, you know, someone in in different department who doesn't need to be involved in, you know, a different aspect that sometimes, you know, you when you have too many cooks in the kitchen, there's more opportunities for things to get delayed and go wrong. So really identifying early on what the specific components are and identifying who's responsible will make it, you know, so much easier. Right, Megan, and that goes directly into the framework portion of it. And as you move through that project, you can, you know, you can figure out how many people you actually need on it and who is the, who is better at resourcing to specific um, allocations. So I really appreciate you adding that. That's a great point. We can put right. that back up in our lessons learned as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Perfect. Um, so next slide, please, if we are able to. Um, yeah, so kind of the final final um, item that we kind of want to bring up within kind of setting yourself up for success and best practices, um, you'll want to make sure that you really understand the financial requirements that are set forth by the grant. Um, and so it's, it's important that within when you're coming up with a budget and kind of those financial projections that you accurately estimate um, kind of what you're putting into the grant. So utilize bids if you have any invoices, previous experience, or have worked with partners in the past, utilize all of that information um, that you've kind of collected over the years um, for accurately estimating kind of what you're putting forth. Um, we also see all the time that assumptions can be overlooked to some extent. Um, it's very important that when you're creating your financial projections that you do not look over the assumptions. You'll want the reviewer to really understand how you got um, the projections that you're putting forth. Um, and kind of the, the last piece for um, that we see required a lot within uh, the financial elements of grants is being able to portray the sustainability and the viability of your project. So you'll wanna show the reviewer how your project will last over time. So not just saying, okay, these are the projections we came with, but how are you going to back that sustainability? Um, are you doing marketing and outreach strategies? Um, do you have a really good take rate in other locations that have kind of aligned with this. You'll wanna show the longevity of the system um, and kind of how that, that project will be sustained financially over time. Um, and I, I think a, kind of the last thing on the budget that I wanna to touch on um, is the importance of really understanding what the grant is asking for. Um, the financial requirements are not, um, not always laid out the same exact way in every single grant. Um, for example, the reconnect grant application is very, very, very um, kind of hefty when it comes to financials. Um, so you'll wanna make sure when you're kind of addressing um, what grant opportunities really will support your vision and your organization and your project, make sure that it, those financial requirements also are in alignment with what your goals are. Um, so some of the state grants may not require as much financially um, and as much financial information, but some of the other grant opportunities will be a bit more in depth. So Megan, if you wanted to expand on any of those points. I mean, I think I think you covered a lot of a lot of the big ones. Um, it, you know, beginning with coming back to the project management of identifying who's going to be in charge of different financial components, right? So the people putting together your project budget might be different than the people putting together, um, you know, your pro forma to show that sustainability throughout five years, or the people who you need to collect audited financials from. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things, and these are also components, you know, Sarah was talking about, sometimes we have this wait time between, between when we know a grant is coming and when it's actually released, great time to work on finances. Um, we find that you know, whether it's a reconnect or a state grant, so reconnect is through the USDA. Um, finances are usually one of the components that take the longest. Um, so that's something that you wanna make sure you're, you're upfront on that, 
you've got the right people in line um, that you know who's going to be pricing out different components um, and that you understand what is eligible and what's not eligible. Um, so I think, you know, Sarah's points, all of them are, are, are great and I, I second all of it. Yeah, no, that's, those are some great points. Um, so I do have um, a question for you actually, um, but it's about, you know, how can grant funded broadband initiatives be sustained over the long term? So I think, I think um, you know, when we're talking about broadband funded initiatives, I think we've kind of stepped back and forth between thinking of um, digital equity and thinking of broadband infrastructure. Um, so when you're thinking of a broadband infrastructure project, um, you're gonna be thinking of sustainability in terms of how much revenue are you going to be collecting from the project? Um, you know, that's the good, indicator um, looking at what kind of uh, you know products and equipment you're putting into that and what is the lifespan of those you know when might you need to be replacing it if you're looking at something that's more uh, into wireless right that equipment needs to be replaced more often than if you're doing a fiber fully fiber project um, so that kind of comes to the sustainability as well um, but certainly that revenue aspect of it when you're talking about a digital equity project, which usually is something that will involve a lot more um, kind of engagement, um, usually there's a teaching component, a training component. Um, you'll have to think about sustainability in terms of, you know, making sure you have strong partners, right? Making sure that you have the people who are committed to this project, to this goal, um, and that they're in line to continue the work, right? Um, and I would say, you know, one thing that is always good to consider is kind of a train the trainers, right? So when you're training people in, in a digital equity skill, are you also then enabling them to train others, right? So then when you talk about that benefit, it's sustainable and that it's continuing to be passed down, um, that these skills are, are continuing to be taught. Um, so sustainability looks very different um, for, for, you know, both of those kinds of projects, because one is very tangible and has an actual you know revenue component to it when you're when you're building infrastructure uh, while the other is more of a skills and equity and access um, and so they look very different um, but I think it does come back to for that that digital equity component thinking about your partners and making sure that you um, have that community support right so if the community doesn't know your project will you know possibly fall dead because you don't have enough engagement yeah, of course. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that valuable insight. You know, that's, that's some great points that you have. Um, I think that pretty much gives us to the next slide. Yeah, so I would say this kind of uh, comes back to, I think, perhaps the first comment that, that I started with is that um, in any kind of community development, in any kind of work now, uh, broadband connectivity is essential. Um, and as we continue moving forward, it's gonna play a bigger and bigger part. Um, the innovation we're seeing already with what can be done with internet connection and, and talking about the speeds, um, right? So a lot of digital or a lot of, of grants for broadband, you'll, you'll see them ask, can this support future innovation, right? Because future innovation will require higher speeds. Um, but from that, you know, I, we can understand some of them right now, you know, when we talk about, about telehealth, when we can talk about um, not only access to appointments, but aging at home um, is, is a huge thing to be thinking about and the ability to age at home if you have that digital connectivity. Um, you know, we obviously there is the, the job component of it and we're seeing all sorts of jobs, you know, being developed because of having access um, and so it really is kind of the foundation of, of community development work. Uh, we are in a digital age. Um, and so, you know, it's it's just a component of what it is. And I think we'll only continue to grow and expand as we move into the future. 
Yeah, and just kind of bouncing off of that, um, a big element that we're seeing within with grant opportunities is being able to showcase not just the community, the households, but also how is this serving anchor institutions and even public safety? Because broadband really extends into every single sector now. Um, and so utilize that significance within your projects and be able to kind of showcase that it kind of goes back to the storytelling because broadband really is essential for painting the future stories that our generations are going to have right no that's that's fantastic um a great point i wanted to kind of open up the floor actually to the people in the chat as well as rob zarnesky if he's here if he can chime in if there's anything that he wants to kind of add um as we're talking about broadband and grants All right, if not, if Rob is not here, I have one more question for you guys. And it is, um, what or how can grant funded broadband initiatives be sustained over the long term? So, yeah, I would say, um, you know, I think talked briefly about um, how, how you'll want your, your network to be sustained. Um, I would kind of go back and, and you know, discuss too, recognizing that uh, you might require more than one source of funding. Um, that, you know, a lot of times there's a very big need, um, there's grant li uh, funding limits, so you might not be able to request more than 20 million and you might have a $40 million project. Um, so looking at those multiple sources of funding to keep that work going and so it doesn't stop. Right. If you only count on that one source and then it's not enough and you fall short, you have a big delay. So making sure you think through, you know, how much uh, is this going to cost? How much do I need? What are the opportunities um, to make sure that the work of doing it can be sustained um, beyond kind of just once it's, you know, lit up and, and as they say, you know, that it's running and you have subscribers. Right. Yeah, no, that's um, that's fantastic. All right, well, I really appreciate the both of you coming on to this and helping us kind of describe more about this wonderful grant writing process. You know, I, I really appreciate our partnership with you. Um, I'm going to leave the floor, actually, to see if there's anybody who's in the chat that wants to kind of add anything, any questions, we can answer that for you. So I'll just give that a few seconds to see if anyone wants to put anything in the chat. Um, again, we have some wonderful panelists that can answer pretty much anything. And I'll give that about 10 more seconds. All right. Well, again, I appreciate every single one of you from being here. Um, and, you know, we have our conclusion. I'll read it out for you all. But you know, broadband access is essential for social, economic, and educational progress and bridging, bridging the digital divide and empowering communities. And that grants play a very crucial role in community development. It provides opportunities for growth and innovation, um, which was shared with us. And also that crafting compelling grant proposals requires storytelling, impact demonstration, and alignment with organizational goals. And thank you so much, for Sarah, for sharing that with us. And that successful grant management involves building a robust project management framework and implementing sound financial practices. And all of these four points are extremely important for this, so I hope this is the takeaway that you all have. Um, so I wanted to share our resources, and um, that will be included in an email sent out afterwards. Um, but we have this all included if you want to get in touch with any of us or continue with our webinar series. And again, I appreciate all of you for being here um, and for Sarah and Megan um, for helping us with this today. But again, thank you all so much. And I really appreciate it. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, team.